All right, guys, thank you for coming today. Uh, can everybody hear me? All right, um, so let's see. We're very happy to have you. Um, if you haven't had lunch yet, we have Panera Bread, as you can see, box lunches. Feel free to grab them at any time. Um, before I introduce our panelists, I just want to give a thank you to everyone that has helped support the event. Um, this this um, panel is funded by the NSF program, LSAMP. LSAMP is a Lewis Stokes um, minority participation program, so it basically funds and supports minorities interested um, in pursuing STEM degrees. Um, so, let's see, welcome. Um, let's see, a few other thank yous. Um, we have our STEM administrators, Kayla Silver and Stephanie Adams, that have done most of the organizing for this event, and this event would not have gone on without them, so thank you guys very much. And we also have the STEM Starter Academy as well. They work to fund STEM activities and programs in the division. Um, and they were working a little bit with us for registration as well. So thank you. All right, so we have our panelists here. Before we get started, let me um, introduce them. So first we have uh, Professor Madhu Dar. Um, Madhu is an associate professor of physics and astronomy at uh, Middlesex Community College. She does research in weather-related physics, and she works, has done postdoctoral work at the University of Massachusetts Lowell and NASA. Um, at NASA, she, uh, uh, during her research time, she worked to characterize plasma and then the Earth's magnetic sphere using um, radio frequency range. She's also worked at Boston College and has taught at UMass Lowell, Salem State, Merrimack College. From 2018 to 2022, she was the MCC STEM Club chairperson and has worked continually on um, encouraging and retaining women in the STEM field. Um, currently and recently, she has set up the virtual observatory between Merrimack College, MCC, and then UML um, with their equipment. So thank you, Madhu. Um, we also have, before we get started, Danielle DeCicero. She is a senior associate product manager at Rapid Micro Biosystems. Danielle grew up in Villarica and graduated from BMHS. She got her bachelor's degree at Riviera University and has more than 12 years experience in microbiology research. In 2019, Danielle began working at Rapid Micro Biosystems in manufacturing process engineer. And then in 2021, she became the product manager. So thank you for coming, Danielle. We have Sharon Dingle. Sharon holds the role as Regional Business Development Manager at Hitachi's Energy Transformer Products. She works in the field of renewable energy and industrial market segments. Throughout her career, she has had various roles in technical sales as well as in electrical power equipment. Um, Sharon has worked at let's see, Westinghouse, General Electric, Siemens, uh, Schneider Electric. Sharon holds a BS in Interdisciplinary Engineering and Management from Clarkson University and a MS in Engineering Management from Clarkson. So thank you for coming, Sharon. Shauna Curran is our MBA and she has relentlessly championed inclusion, equity, and belonging um, in business and in the workforce. She has men held many diverse positions, including software and IT industries, leading global software development, quality writing, and operations teams. Um, recently, uh, well, she founded um, and is now the CEO of STEM Energy to develop programs for based on her professional and personal experiences. STEM Energy focuses on breaking down social and emotional barriers that hinder women of color from entering and thriving in the STEM careers. Thank you for coming, Shauna. And finally, we have Nicoletta. Nicoletta is a manufacturing engineer working on implementing process improvements and streamlining workforce flows. She has had multiple international projects in plant operations and supplier evaluations. Um, and currently, she is a principal process engineer with BAE Systems in Merrimack, New Hampshire. Um, Nicoletta and BAE Systems employs many of our MCC employers. Nicoletta is also an adjunct professor here at Middlesex, teaching in design for manufacturing, AutoCAD, intro to engineering, and microcomputer applications. Um, let's see, for the next portion of this event, 
We'll have each of our panelists talk a little bit more for 10 minutes on some of their engineer, uh, their education experience, their career journeys, and anything else they would like to share. At the end of the hour, we will allow students to be able to ask questions and maybe have a future discussion. If you have to leave early, make sure that you fill out the survey um, just to let us know and give us some feedback about today's event. So thank you. Okay. Um, we have a microphone here if you'd like to use it, or you can just go ahead and start. <coughs> Oh, it's not this. It's like, not me first. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no
or a mass exodus of our community happened in 1990. And I could not imagine thinking of going to space at that time. The basic things were existence, right? So, but what kept us going was family support. Family support, relatives that support you. Um, and uh, my father, who kept on encouraging me all the time, uh, this is just going to be a minor blimp in your entire life when you look back at it. This is just going to give you some learning experience. So do not feel low. Do not stop your education was the only mantra. And we kept on, my father supported us, all of us, uh, to complete education. And I don't know how we managed it, but I did complete um, my undergrad in electronics. Uh, I, was, I came from high school, but whatever were the difficulties, I'm, I'm just uh, supporting this fact that education is very important. Don't give up on that. No matter what the struggles are there, if you take a break, do jump back in, okay? So um, I completed my uh, undergrad in electronics, a uh, fun course, then I did my master's in microprocessors, um, and followed by, I wanted to be a nuclear scientist at that time, because I thought, okay, I can go to um, Baba Atomic Research Center, is a really uh, prestigious institute for nuclear research and all other research. So I uh, wanted to go in the nuclear physics side. Something happened there, there because uh, the condition uh, our community was in, some communities were not favoring our, because we had flocked that region and they thought that we are taking away their spots. So I did not like that environment, so I thought, okay. Uh, then I was selected in a department of science and technology funded by government of India, uh, an experimental uh, program which was based on very low frequency uh, waves that we studied, that, she, uh, that Marie gave an uh, introduction about. So that PhD was related to that. Um, so this was all done up to in India, my doctorate and all these uh, qualifications were in India. But when I came here to um, in US, I started teaching as well as researching. So I was hired by a Boston College first uh, to work on um, global positioning system and wide area augmentation services. So I was a visiting scholar at that time, but not permanent yet. But all these experiences somewhere uh, kind of um, give you an idea what you want to do, because after coming from India, it was a restart. It was a switch that was a restart for me again. Then um, after a couple of years of uh, working at UMass Lowell, also as a postdoc, so I have a double postdoc, one from India and one from UMass Lowell. And uh, then a couple of years back in 2016, I also wanted to understand the higher education system here, because if you notice that none of my uh, qualifications were from US. So in order to understand how the uh, colleges and universities work here, I uh, did my master's in higher education from Merrimack College because I was working also there, so it was easy, and it's right outside my house. So it was fun experience being uh, with the students who were half my age, and they were quick, and I was, I was no, I have, to, I have to be like them. So they kind of helped me accelerate uh, my uh, learning process, because when you are with a very intelligent group, you also become, you kind of, uh, that intelligence rubs on you as well. So these are the qualifications that I gathered over time. Um, did I use all of them? Uh, I think a little bit, little bit from everywhere. I think physics stayed for a long time with me and astronomy, my favorite one. Um, this was all the teaching experience, but uh, this was all the educational experience, but my teaching experience here, I started teaching in India in army school and uh, when I was doing my doctorate. So because, as you all know, the condition we were in, it, it was a great economic crunch at that time. We had to work. Many of you do the same thing here. You work and study. I did the same thing. Um, and I was teaching 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 class uh, students physics. So physics is, uh, teaching physics didn't start here. It started right from high school and middle school in India. I taught around, um, while I was doing my doctorate, I always also was teaching. Uh, how it worked during daytime, I was teaching and my work was experimental work. So the, the, the data that I used to get was more uh, prevalent uh, afternoons and evenings. So I used to get that data towards evening. So I used to be in my university around till 10 o'clock. So the balance was there. 
Okay, so I was working. So when I came here, um, I started my research work at UMass Lowell, where there was a NASA-funded project based on uh, my uh, doctoral topic. So it was easy. And then uh, I started teaching at UMass Lowell also because my supervisor um, had a lot of projects to get for the funding. They had they keep on researching. So I started teaching in classes, and that's how my teaching career started here in UMass Lowell. I then also uh, taught at Merriman College and also at Salem State University. This was this date back dates back to 2005, 2006 on. So it's been so many years. So I remember I started teaching here in US um, around 2006. Um, so it's been a long journey. And Middlesex Community College, I started uh, teaching from 2017. So. So my doctoral research, you must be wondering, what did I actually do in my doctorate? So it's, um, we get uh, whistlers and very low frequencies of PC emissions from the ionosphere. So you all must be aware that your um, atmosphere has layers, right? They are stratosphere, exosphere, and then there's ionosphere. Beyond the ionosphere, we have many, many more layers, which normally we don't uh, talk about. That is plasma sphere, magnetosphere, plasma pause. And these are very important blankets for us to save us from ultraviolet radiations from the sun and also from the plasma that is striking the earth. So that is the topic that was for my research. And uh, we get these waves, very low frequency waves. They travel from conjugate uh, poles. So whatever is happening in South Pole travels within a waveguide. I hope you understand what is waveguide. Uh, like we have fiber optics and there's multiple reflections happening inside and there's a carrier signal inside that goes from one end to another end. In the same way, in our ionosphere, there is a waveguide, there's a region where the, reflection, the wave that is traveling undergoes multiple reflections and reaches the conjugate point. So whatever is happening in the southern hemisphere is then translated um, in stew on spot uh, in the northern hemisphere. So this, uh, th that used to give us the idea about what is the temperature there in the southern hemisphere using cold math equations, okay? Uh, not that we could feel the temperature, the mathematical treatment and the math maths would help us get the temperature, the electron density. Um, you are, most of you are STEM students here, so you understand what is density. Electron density would give us other parameters about the ionosphere. So all this information, you, you may think that, oh, this is very mathematical, very physics stuff, but believe me, all those people who are creating these GPS and global positioning uh, systems and wide area augmentation services need these details. So they need a physics and a mathematics professor uh, so, they, so that they can get them the code and the equations to put it in the software, which the engineer will later on work on. It's, it's a coordinated effort, so physics is important. So this is the waveguide that I was trying to tell you. Like we get, uh, if we have a lightning happening in the southern pole, and if there's a receiver in the northern region that tracks, uh, that gives us the data. So I was collecting data, and I was at the receiver end. I was collecting the data via a very tall antenna that was erected on the on our building in the university, and uh, I was analyzing that data. That was my work, and my doctoral thesis was work around that. So it's too much to explain that. It's very, very complicated. But I hope you got the um, gist of this. If I ever have a chance if I, if, to send this out to you, if I click on these links, it, uh, the, the conjugate waves that we were getting, they sound like music. So they are called whistlers. That's why they're called whistlers. Uh, or they will sound like sirens, as if a cop is coming. So this is the, these are not coughs. These are, this is the data coming from the conjugate hemisphere, which will actually be analyzed later to give us information about the opposite pole. Okay? Yeah. So where did this data come from? This, these are uh, some of the antennas that look like this tall, and they are in US also. Many uh, Stanford works on this uh, as well. So all over the world, there is work happening on these uh, very low frequency emissions. 
and whistlers. Okay? If I ever get a chance to talk about this later, I'll let you know what is the science behind this. We are short of time, so uh, all my study was related to sun-earth connection because whatever sun is do, uh, spewing out, it is also coming to us. If we happen to, if there's a coronal mass ejection happening, there are solar events happening every uh, every 11 years. How many of you know? We go to solar minima and solar maxima. When we are in maxima, it wrecks havoc in the ionosphere. Um, if you remember, there was a generator that burned many, many years back in Canada because of the excessive dumping of energy on the uh, electric generator, and there was a uh, wide range electric electricity outage because of that event. So you can't run cover for, from that. There's nothing you can do. It's an it's a, uh, atmospheric or ionospheric event. You cannot stop it from happening. But yes, we can prepare for it by warning, uh, uh, warning our astronauts who are performing a spacewalk. They shouldn't be around outside, outside their capsules during those events because they will get excessive dumping of uh, uh, radiations on them. So we all know how hazardous it is out there for them. So I'll advance the slide. I don't want to describe this more. I think I have three minutes more. Um, I was working at UMass Lowell on a NASA funded project called IMAGE. Um, and we had one component. Uh, we built one component in UMass Lowell Space Science Lab. And at that, after five years of getting, giving us very good results, the antenna broke in the plasma sphere and we stopped getting any data. And that was the end of my research there because research is always funded, okay? So if there is no research happening, there's no fund. And that's how I came into teaching. You have to continue, right? So I went into full-time teaching after this. But I still really, really want to get into research again. So I'm advancing some slides now. At Merrimack College, I was, uh, I was involved in Women in STEM LLC. We, uh, I, uh, I created a Women in STEM uh, Living Learning Center there, so students uh, with same, similar interests would uh, cohort and live in the same dorms so that they can do their homeworks together. And so I was responsible for this. This was my master's capstone as well there. And apart from that, I was also uh, working with Lawrence Middle School, and I was a uh, mentor and advisor for STEM club there with little girls anxious and curious all the time about science, so it was my best period teaching uh, little kids about science. We would do lava, uh, volcanoes, and other experiments. So that was uh, service learning through Merrimack College. And here at MCC, we did cool stuff, and I have a partner in crime, uh, Professor Algara. Here, we were both advisors of STEM club, and we did, um, all, uh, by, we, we were using, um, we, we took students uh, to Boston Museum, and uh, gave them opportunities to check out various um, scientific stuff there. We had rocket launches here, and we also had students compete uh, for national competitions, so we did have positive results. So that was um, our STEM club time uh, at MCC, but unfortunately we have to pass the baton on so that other professors can do it. Um, now we are not the club advisors anymore, but we are good friends. <laughs> so I have still not given up on my dreams, and uh, your dream doesn't have uh, an expiration date take a deep breath and try again. You never know where you'll find me later, okay? And there's miles to go before I sleep. So I'm not going into slumber. You never know where I'll be next time you see me at NASA. <laughs> Just kidding. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, no, that's at the end. Oh, that's so cool. What science things? We're going to have questions at the end. Yeah. Wow. The amazing story that just told. Wow. That's so many That was pretty impressive. Now we are like, oh my god. I know. None of us want to go. What are you going to say? She said.
Uh, I was at an event like this sometime during my formative years at Middle Four Sigma, and I forgot what I did in front of 12 year olds, actually at Lawrence Middle School, so that was interesting. Uh, totally forgot what I did for a living. Gross. Remembered my name, so that's good. Um, but it comes. If, if you work at it and you find your methods, you know, um, I don't have slides, I kind of feel like maybe I should, but um, I can't go off of the script because it messes me up. So all that to say, I spent 12 years, and then I started going, what do I do, right? I'm a little bit bored, I've learned a lot, can't really seem to move anywhere else in the company. I tried to apply for roles, got, well, you don't have any commercial experience, so you haven't done this, you haven't done that. You know, come back after you get that experience. But I was really good at that one thing. And then one day a recruiter came knocking, and uh, it was to become a process engineer, and as a biologist, I had never heard the word engineer be referenced to me, right? So I was like, are, are you sure? Did you get the right resume? Because I, I don't understand. But I had picked up some skills along my pathway. Like the experiments that I designed in micro were design of experiments. So the engineering principles were very rigidly applied, even though the data was kind of depending on, you know, the mood of the microorganisms or the temperature, right? They're, they're always a little bit outside of tolerances that engineers like, but the principles were the same. So I took the job, and that was wonderful. I did manufacturing engineering, um, which I didn't know what that was. I still don't know that I was doing it correctly. Um, but around that time, so now we're about four years out from present day, and started going, hmm, I kind of like finance. What's that about? And so one of the opportunities that I love at Rapid is that I can walk right up to our CFO or our CEO and say, hey, you got 15 minutes? I have a few questions. And I always get it. I don't get it really fast, right? I have to be patient. But I'm now going to turn down for a conversation. And it doesn't have to be a big ask. It's just, what's your day look like? I have no idea what you do on a daily basis. Could you share some thoughts? And so from that conversation I had with the CFO, I applied for a master's and then graduated last year in April uh, with my MBA, which was something I had been looking to do for years and years and years and had just never really taken the step. Right? There's always life on the way. I have two small children, you know, I was working full time, it's very busy. Um, but it, it found a way and it found me. And so that facilitated my move into product management, which again, I love. So I know kind of what I want to do for a living. And this gets back to what I do at Rapid. So we build a lab in a box. Uh, so that job I had as an intern where I'm sticking auger plates to the floor and the walls and counting those. We build a machine that does that. And that takes the data and counts it. We have an algorithm, there's software behind it, and then it spits that result out to any program that you want. So all of that data integrity, all of those things that are so critical, is just process. And so my job is software uh, services for that instrument. It's just a really interesting mesh of all of the things that I started with in my life, you know, the microbiology, um, I was always a bit of a computer nerd, but I still cannot get past Hello World and Python. I've tried. Every year I do an hour of code, and I still do the same thing, and it's great, but I haven't figured out what that element is. Again, going back to why am I doing the lab? What am I practicing? I haven't bridged that gap yet. Um, but hearing stories about how other people do it usually can help me learn. So um, I'm trying to think. Am I, how am I doing on time? Are we good? Two minutes? Two minutes. Cool. Two minutes. All right, um, so what's my day like nowadays? Because I haven't been in the lab, um, at least not to do an experiment officially in about a year and a half. Uh, I miss it sometimes, because not gonna lie, listen to some audio books and sit there and pipette or do whatever, right? There's a lot of repetitive tasks that can be really soothing, um, and it's when you can think. But nowadays, I sort of sneak into the lab sometimes and <laughs> conduct some experiments. They haven't taken the badge away. Um, but I like to explore, right? Again, I like to hear what people do and see how it can connect because it usually can connect. You know, I'm not good at physics. However, I do know that is a component of my system. You know, we have this algorithm looking at brightness over time and there's all these pixels and things. And so just the knowledge that I may not know it or understand it fully, but to know who to talk to, right? Or to read a paper that at least gets me on the same page. That's sort of my focus, and it's a joy. So can't wait to hear your questions and hear the other amazing stories.
Hopefully I lowered the ball far a little bit, so who wants to go there? <laughs> basically an army grant. We lived around the world, moved all over the place. Um, I think as a kid, um, I don't know what motivated me, but I love science. Um, I wasn't that good at math, believe it or not, but I ended up um, you know, taking AP physics in high school, love science. You know, my uncle was a bricklayer, and I thought, oh, he's always talking about these cool places he's building. I thought, maybe I'll become a civil engineer. So I ended up um, going to Clarkson University, um, after taking a surveying class, I decided, no, I don't want to do this. This was really boring. And there were a lot of bugs, you know, when you're doing surveying outside. So I thought, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I ended up in a uh, program called Engineering and Management. And actually, it was a great program. It was, um, we had business courses. We had all of the same um, engineering courses you'd have, you know, during your first two years. It was kind of a, ba a general background. So we had electrical engineering, mechanical. Um, you know, manufacturing processes, you name it, and all the business courses. And the career track for people in our department was to either go into manufacturing engineering or technical sales. So companies like General Electric, Westinghouse, Honeywell, what they would do is they would recruit students from our, our uh, now it's Clarkson University. Um, and what we would do is we would join the company and then they would put us on a training program. And it was a, you know, you were, you were called a sales engineer, um, you went through a technical program where you would study, you know, the product designs, the features, and also understand what it would be like to work with customers, sales, sales 101 type training, and that sort of thing. Um, and when I graduated from college, I took a job with Westinghouse. I spent, let's see, I think I was with them for about eight years, and I took various roles. I worked in one of the factories, um, pricing equipment, electrical power equipment. So. Anything that you would see, like in an electrical room, you know, for a, a, a commercial building or an industrial facility, we would provide the equipment for that. Um, then I, I took on a sales role, I took on a marketing role, eventually went to work for General Electric, um, had various roles there. It brought me actually, the, that was the most interesting job I think I had because I got to visit all kinds of customers. I got to visit paper mills, steel mills. Uh, I get to visit Intel facilities, uh, many, you know, pharmaceutical plants. So I had a little bit of an exposure to just about every type of industry that you can think of. Um, so fast forward, I worked for several companies. You generally tend to, if you stay in the same industry, you tend to jump from one company to the next. Um, you know, one day a person could be your boss. At one company, the next day he might be your coworker, and then you you might run into him again 20 years later at another company. So, you know, very uh, very um, not sure what the word is, but we all like I said, we jump around. Um, the company I work for now actually is a little bit of the original Westinghouse company I work for, and several other companies. Um, they were actually part of ABB. You guys might be familiar with ABB in the electrical world. They're very, um, they're known for their automation and robotics global company. Um, they actually sold our division or our business to Hitachi, which is a huge Japanese company. And they have like, I think, I think they own like 800 companies worldwide. So it's a huge, I mean, it's, it's, it's just amazing, you know, how many, how many companies these people have acquired over the years. And um, our, what we do is we mainly manufacture transformers. So if you see, a transformer outside of a building, that might be one of ours. Or if you go by a utility substation, you see those giant transformers, that's something else that we manufacture and sell. Um, right now, the most exciting thing about what I'm doing is the industry we're involved in is mostly the renewable energy industry has just taken off. So, you know, you see wind turbines going up all over the country, you see solar farms. Um, now you've got electric vehicle infrastructure being developed. Um, so we're supplying the transformers that then take the power 
and then transform it from a higher voltage down to a lower voltage and then distributes it into the system. So it's, it's a really exciting industry to be in right now. So I think, you know, if you're thinking about um, maybe you don't want to be a design engineer, technical sales is a wonderful career to go into. You know, it's kind of the best of both worlds. I mean, you're talking with technical people, but you're also, um, you know, you know, problem solving for them too, because you might have a customer who's trying to design a system, and you know, let's say you represent a company that manufactures equipment, and you have to understand what his problem is, help him solve it, and then you know, take take the application that he might have, and then see if your company can can support that. So. You know, having the technical uh, background, the engineering background, is great for understanding that because one of the things that's really important, and regardless of what you do in your career, is communication and being able to communicate well with whoever you're dealing with, whether it's an engineering person, finance person, marketing person, your boss, your coworker, whatever. Um, you know, don't be, don't, you know, don't feel that if you're going into technical sales that you have to you know, speak like an engineer. It's really just communicating basic facts. That's, that's what learning how to boil it down to a simple, simple solution for your customer. So it's a great, great field to go into, I think. Um, you know, I personally think having the technical background actually helped me in terms of being a sales engineer or a salesperson because it really, engineering helps you to learn how to problem solve, right? It helps you to take Take a scenario and break it down, you know, understand all of the, um, the attributes of a problem, and then kind of put it back together. And that's something that, that I found has actually helped me throughout my whole life, regardless whether I was in a job or a personal situation. Um, you know, it's just a great foundation. And, you know, I'm so glad to see more and more women in the STEM, going into these STEM careers. I mean, there's just tremendous opportunities for you, for everybody, really. Um, and you look at, you know, the world that we're living in now, too, I mean, I think um, as a, you know, young person entering into a career, I mean, our world is so technical, whether it's dealing with cell phones, I mean, you know, we, when I was a child, we never, when I was in high school, we didn't even have calculators, I mean, we had slide rules and we used our fingers to count, right? <laughs> but, but the thing is, though, I mean, you know, the more, the more technical understanding you have, I think it just, helps you with, with every aspect of your life. And so I, you know, I don't have the educational background like some of you folks. I haven't taught except the only thing I did do. So a little bit about my career history and personal history. I, I actually took time out when I had kids. So when my children were born, one and three, I actually stopped working. Um, but then what I did was I really got involved in my local community, took over um, the um, after school program and you know, develop the curriculum for it and actually tried to bring in as much engineering and science type programs into that. So, you know, I've always had an interest in helping, you know, teach STEM, or well, not teach STEM, but support STEM. Uh, I was very involved in Society of Women Engineers for a number of years, um, and that's how I got to know Marie over the years. And, you know, we did some great projects that helped encourage younger students, high school students, uh, middle age, middle school students to go into um, technical fields, or at least, you know, dabble in some of the, the fun activities that they have out there. So I guess I'm kind of a nerd at heart. Um, I guess I always will be. <laughs> um, as far as uh, graduate school, I actually went to graduate school in 2004 and 2006 at Tufts. Um, it was an engineering master management master's program because I had an interest in maybe moving up into more of a managerial role. Um, the program was really designed for people that were in a technical environment just to learn how to become a leader. Um, we had, you know, product management type courses. It's just really interesting stuff. I actually didn't finish it though until last spring. So I had one thing left to do and that was my master's thesis. Um, life gets in the way. You'll, you'll find that all the way through your, throughout your life and your career. Um, don't be afraid to stop what you're doing and pick it up later on. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so I actually ended up picking up my master's 15 years later and um, you know last last semester I had to do uh, instead of the thesis they gave me an option to do three courses so I took three classes um, never left the house fortunately I had somebody bring me meals and between that and working at home with my job it was like a 24/7 out 24/7 um, effort but it was well worth it and I got to 
to walk last last spring, so that was kind of cool. And even though, um, and so the joke was for me, I was going to finish my master's when I turned 50, and that never happened. So I actually finished when I was 65. So, <laughs> so you know, it's never too late, right? <laughs> you can, uh, you know, and you can always, you know, spend your whole. I mean, it, it you know. You don't have to always know what you want to do. It's just, you know, just go with the next thing that interests you and explore it. And the other thing, too, I've also discovered over life, you know, because I've worked for different companies, that, you know, had a um, career mostly in the same area. I've kind of stepped out of it a few times. One thing I notice is that everything I've done has led to the next opportunity. And I really enjoy going back and realizing that nothing I've done is in vain. I've learned from every opportunity, every experience, and that's, you know, helped to make me what I am today. So, you know, never look back and say, oh, I wish I had done that, or wish I had taken that path. It all adds up, and, you know, it, it creates who you are. And so, anyways, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Impressive. They, they, uh, I don't know what well, I'm going to do. Now. They blow my mind, right? So, wow, impressive. Uh, thank you, ladies. So, I am Nicoletta Cozy. A little bit about my background now, because we talk about background, right? So, I'm originally from Romania. I was born in Transylvania, two hours away from Dracula Castle, right? So, you guys who know Dracula Castle. You know, because people, if I say Romania, they ask me which part of South Africa, North Africa, I'm like, okay. So if I say Transylvania, oh, oh okay, it's Europe, right? Yeah, yeah, it's Europe. So uh, two hours away from Dracula Castle, uh, we are big in castles, so I love it. I go home to see uh, my, my castle every year. So uh, I grew up in communism. I don't know about you guys, if you know how much you know about communism, restriction, no food. They dictate everything you have to do. I was 14 when communists collapsed, thank God, and we become free country. So uh, we become free country and I loved it because I knew I can do and I can be who I wanted to be. So I went to a technical school. I loved physics, but I hated calculus. <laughs> <laughs> and I always say to my students, hey, suck it up a cup, you're not gonna make it if you don't do calculus, right? I hate it, especially calculus three, I struggle but I knew I need to get a B to go to my major, right? So I knew I had to do well, I knew I have to, uh, to do to succeed. So I was very technical. I went to a technical high school, uh, I did uh, you know, electronics, and uh, I told my parents I want to go to a polytechnic institute in Romania. They look at me and like, why you cannot be like your sisters? Go play your music, dance, whatever, be a girl. I'm like, what, what? What, what kind of job is that, right? So I was different, right? I wanted to do something different. So my father encouraged me to say, okay, you're gonna go to technical school, you're gonna go to a polytechnic institute. And I got in, free scholarship. Uh, I was so happy, it was a free school. Uh, we were like uh, six girls and 150 guys. My word, I loved it, right? So they treat me equal, they, but I love the part of you know working with the guys and the girls. and. They protect us, and I did so much, and I, I enjoy it. So I went to Polytechnic Institute three hours away from my home, and I loved it, far away from my parents. So I need that freedom to kind of, you know, grow up a little bit faster and like be independent. And uh, I said, okay, uh, I go five classes, I take five classes, I'm gonna go to school, but I still have free time, and I want to make extra money. Even my school is paid off. I have to make money, I don't want, you know, to, Still, my parents, I wanted to make a living. So I went to a company and I knocked to the door and I said, listen, I am a student, I'm going to Polytechnic Institute. I wanted to build that experience. I want to be an engineer, I don't know what kind. I'm freshman year, give me an opportunity to work for my, you know, I'm good with my hands. So, and they hired me in second shift. I did assembly line for five years till I finish up my degrees and everything. I did soldering, I become so good on soldering, technician, I did testing, I did troubleshooting, I did repair, everything to help me 
when I finished my engineering degree to decide what I wanted to do. My bachelor was in electrical engineering. I didn't end up working as an electrical engineer. I am doing manufacturing engineer because I love building stuff. I do. And when I finished my degree, uh, a company came, we have like, you know, uh, and they came uh, in the end of the May and they, I applied for a job and looked that up to my resume and said, oh my gosh, you've been doing manufacturing for five years. When did you have the time to do that? And five classes, like, yeah, I, I love it. And I make an extra buck and I love it even more, right? I'm independent, you know, I, I build experience. So even my bachelor was an electrical engineer and never worked as an electrical engineer. I did manufacturing, more mechanical, because I love to build stuff. So I, worked, I was happy and uh, lucky enough to work for an American company overseas. Uh, and I did uh, process engineering. This is what I did, process engineering. And I got my master's degree in robotics. Couple of years into work, I kind of got bored a little bit. I said, you know what? I want to travel, I want to see the world, I want to experience new things. Even my job overseas in Romania was bring me all over the Europe. I was traveling to suppliers, I was doing things, I knew how to speak languages, so it was a very easy transition for me. I said, you know what? I'm gonna go to America. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna try it. Well, when I told my Friends, everybody said, oh my gosh, what are you going to do then? Dishwasher? <coughs> Cleaning toilets? This is what, you know, you're going to do. This is what mentality was back then. This was 17 years ago. I said, you know what? I'm ready to go to clean toilets if I have to. I saved some money. I lied to my parents. I told them I'm going to go on a business trip for three months. <laughs> because I didn't want them to be worried. I was 29, 29. I kind of left my car behind, my house, my everything. I took a thousand dollars in my pocket. I Googled, Craigslist came on, you know, Craigslist was back, back then, was big. I found out, you know, in Somerville, I moved to Somerville. I said, okay, where am I gonna go? I know I want to go to the United States, but where should I go? And I picked Massachusetts, why? I said, oh my gosh, MIT, oh my gosh, Harvard, oh my gosh, all those top schools, I, I, I know from movies, I'm gonna go. So I told my parents, hey, mom, dad, I go three months on a business trip, see you later, don't worry about me. I didn't tell only to my brother that what I'm gonna do. My brother called me nuts, crazy, whatever. I said, you know what, let me try, let me try. So I talked to my company, I used to work back, and I said, listen, give me a three months unpaid. I wanted to go to try. If I cannot make it, I'll be back. Keep my, you know, uh, you know they give me like a family leave or whatever absence. So they give me a three months unpaid, I took a thousand bucks, I took my little suitcase, and I moved. I didn't know anyone, I didn't know anything about it. All I knew from movies. Ellie McBeal movies, it was a show on TV, Ellie McBeal, and all those Friends shows and all those, I love those, and I'm gonna go to America. Yeah, I got here, I was 29, my English was okay, but I know I can do better. I got here on April 4th, and I said, okay, what should I do, where should I go, what, I'm by myself, should I go to the community in Romania, should I go to the church, what should I do? I said, you know what? Let me try to be on my own. I know I'm a good engineer. I know I'm good with my hands. I got my degrees. Okay, it's not MIT, but it's a polytechnic institute. I got my master. I got experience. I should try to knock to the door to the company to see if they can hire me. I know I have an accent, but I said, but guess what? Nothing is going to stop me. And I did. I knocked to the door. I went to a company in Lowell, I found the company in Lowell, I interviewed, and I said, give me a chance. This is who I am. I didn't graduate from MIT. This is my degree. Math is math, science is science everywhere. It's try me on. Try to see if I can do the job. They give me a 90 days period, like everybody else back then, and after 90 days, they give me a job as a permanent. And they give me a green card. So what I'm trying to do and say to all of you, even my parents said, you know, and after I told my parents the story, it's like, oh my gosh, 
they call me nuts and crazy. It's like, I wanted to try. And I did clean toilets, and I did clean, I worked in restaurants, selling back and and cheese, and learned about omelets, till I got my paperwork straight out to become legal and everything. I, I've done all those, and you, most of you guys, maybe you, you do that too, right? But I have a dream and a goal. I said, no, I clean toilets for a short period of time. I have a dream. I'm going to make it. Just because I'm an immigrant, just because I'm a woman, I'm going to compete on jobs. And every single job I compete, I was the only one woman. And I went to like maybe 20 companies, knock to the door, send me my resume. Some of them said, no, we hire someone else better. I was like, you know what? If it's someone else better than me, go for it. But give me a chance. And I'm so grateful for this company, Lowell, because they trust in me and they give me that opportunity. Right? So please don't think, and this is what I'm telling to all my students, you know, and uh, I teach here for Middlesex now for 15 years, and it's a story behind that too. Because when I worked in Lowell, I was doing well, you know, I was learning a lot, but I had no family. And I said, okay, it's five o'clock, everybody's going home. What should I do? I'm bored. So someone, I, I talked to my, you know, cohort, I said, listen, I want to learn something new. I know I speak languages, but I moved to the United States. I want to learn the slang. I want to learn you know, American English. I learned British English back home. I want to go to school. I want to do better. And they introduced me to Middlesex Community College. I was living in Lowell. And I started to take classes like, you know, ESL, basic writing, composition one, composition two. And I loved that. I made so many friends. I love the community. And I think three months into the, the learning curve, Middlesex came to me and said, hey, I have a job for you. Do you have a job? I'm like, what do you mean? You've been helping everybody with printers, computers, homework. We have a TA job, or back then was SI, you know. Would you like to apply for it? I said, I have a full-time job as an engineer, but I have free time because I have no family. Fair enough, this was 14, 15 years ago. They gave me a position as a computer application, and I'm still teaching computer application. And a few years later, Engineering department, right? Like, like Michelle Stein and everybody, and uh, we had to have a CAD design department, and they hired me knowing that I'm an engineer. I work, you know, uh, in industry. So I've been with Middlesex now for almost 15 years, teaching between three and five classes, depends, in the morning, right? And I teach every day, Monday to Friday, as today, and at one o'clock, two o'clock, I'm going to my full time job. And I stayed there till 10 p.m. Everybody's calling me nuts. I said, why do you work so much? Why? First, I love it. I love to teach my students. I love to give back to community. I love to give back to Middlesex. Middlesex was so good to me. So good to me. I make such a good, you know, strong relationship, friends. And I work in engineering care department with Professor Chris and Professor Angel over there, right? So we are such a great community, great people. I do it because I love it. I don't do it for money. It's like I come here happy, even I work four hours a night. It's like this is what I sleep. I'm coming here because I love it. So company law will give me that chance. Unfortunately, you know, uh, when the recession, they closed the door. Finally, I got my paperwork straight out. I was free, happy. I told my parents the truth later on. I apologize, but they were happy for me. Because they said, oh my gosh, how did you make it? Because everybody's been telling me that it's so hard to succeed in the United States. How did you make it? I said, I had a dream. I knew what I wanted to do. I'm going to clean toilets. I'm going to work restaurants. I'm going to do, but I have a dream, and I'm going to reach that dream. It's going to be a temporary thing. And all I have to do, improve yourself. Take classes, get involved. And I worked through my experience now, so many companies, and I did, you know, uh, component engineering, I did process engineering, I worked for School for the Blind in, in Watertown, building trailers, and I loved that job. I traveled a lot to India, I was relocated in India for two years. So I traveled all over the world. And they encouraged me to take more classes, and even they pay now for my MBA. So don't stop, you know, 
learning and get educated and don't stop dreaming. And I hear so many students, and now I teach for Middlesex uh, Introduction to Engineering and DFM. I have students coming to me saying, hey, how did you make it? Did you feel like you are a woman and an immigrant and you have an accent? I'm like, hell no, it doesn't bother me at all. This is who I am. I will always have this accent. I'm going to die with this accent. I know that. And I'm OK. But one thing, I will never apologize for who I am. Never. I compete for jobs with top IV schools. I don't care. I go, I compete. And I always say, let the best win. It's not about gender. It's about you. You go there, feel confident, improve yourself, study hard, never to wait to come back to school, right? Never, never come. I have students coming back to, to Middlesex, you know, and they're in 60s or in 50s, and I appreciate them. And I, you know, I always say, never, you know, don't give up on your dream. And just because, you know, and now engineering is like, I love engineering and I'm so passionate about it. And back then in communist, if communists didn't collapse, maybe I would end up playing music for a living or being a math teacher, and it's nothing wrong with that. But that wasn't my passion. My passion was engineering. This is what I wanted to do. And when I went for polytechnic, my parents said, oh my gosh, you are crazy, definitely. But now when, you know, I look back at how much I accomplished being in the United States for 17 years, the opportunities I got to be here and learning and you know I did I did well and I'm not gonna stop where I am I'm still gonna go for more I wanted to get more involved I'm gonna get more educated uh, every single class they offer me and hopefully I'm gonna finish MBA before I you know 65 I'm working really hard to get that too so and pay by the company uh, I don't have to pay a penny so you gotta and this is you know you push yourself and don't give up on your dream and don't get hang up on things like, I am a woman, I am a foreigner, I am an immigrant, I have an accent. Please don't put that in your mind. You gotta go there, get a job, be confident, be strong. You know what you wanted to do. Don't let people telling you that, that say you, you are not qualified because of this. It's not a handicap. Come on. I always say to people, you've got to go there and fight for yourself. Go there in confidence and, you know. And I compete, and every time I go for jobs, sometimes I'm the only one person over there, a woman, and I'm like, well, that's good. You know, sometimes I, I took the job, but, you know, it was me who took the job. Sometimes I don't take it, but if someone refused me or I didn't get the job, I learned from that, and I wasn't upset saying, oh my gosh, they didn't pick me because, you know, I'm a woman. No. They didn't pick me because I am not strong enough. Maybe I'm not the right person for that job. So, and I try to educate myself more and be stronger and, you know, and get, you know, get there and get yourself, you know, on your feet and fight for your rights and fight for who you are to be and go for it. STEM Energy. STEM Energy is a program that um, teaches women to code, and it's a career pivot program, so for ladies further along in their career. Uh, but it's centered on women of color, and it's designed to help them break down the social and emotional barriers that keep them out of careers in tech. Um, and it was developed and designed based on my own experience spending a lot of years in technology and software development. So my career was not a traditional one. My path wasn't traditional. When I was in school, I didn't study 
computer science. I didn't have um, a STEM degree. I actually I studied my, my undergrad is business, you know, and I've got a, a, an MBA right now. Um, so my first job in tech was just doing tech support for a company, doing internal work. Um, I learned everything I needed to learn on the job. But what happened there is that I fell in love with technology. The pay was good. I, was, I liked that. That was nice. But what was also really good was I, I figured out that you could do almost anything and still be in tech and still enjoying yourself. And I loved it. Loved it, loved it. So I played around with some things. I did some um, back-end software development for a little bit. And I discovered pretty quickly that was not my thing at all. That is for other people. Then I tried front-end development. I liked that. Um, I did web design and web development for a little while. I had a little side hustle doing that while I was still working. Eventually, my path led me to leadership. And here is where I started to notice a few patterns. For me, my opportunities for leadership tended to come up for teams that no one else wanted. They were the problem teams. Right? They were difficult. The work they were doing was really important, but no one wanted to manage these teams. These teams were often global teams, and sometimes that meant that those teams were the sum total of diversity at my company. Right? The company itself had its own issues. There were perceptions about the folks on these teams, about their competency, about their mastery of the English language, um, about their ability to contribute. And so inevitably, my first steps were always to work with the company to get through their stuff. Clearly, these people are smart and competent and talented, or you wouldn't have hired them, right? So we'll let them into the meetings. Let's get them a part of that problem solving. Let them throw some ideas out there, right? But at the same time, I had to do work with the teams themselves because these are folks who had been marginalized for a while. It took time for me to help them understand that you do deserve a seat at the table and you do have something to say when you get there. So here's the thing. After I would get these two groups to get through their mess and actually be okay, right, you guys come in, you can contribute, and then they come in and they are contributing. The innovation would explode, legit explode. Like, you, I would spend all my time just trying to keep up. The problem solving, the engagement, and then the, just the joy, the joy you would see from these teams and all the work that they were doing and just having a really good time. And then of course the company, you know, management had all kinds of joy at the extra money they were making with the extra stuff that they were able to put out there and, you know, sell features, new products and things like that, right? Cool. So then I started to notice another pattern. I'm doing all this stuff, teams running great. I'm like, I'm good stuff. You see what I did right there? You see that stuff? I should probably get a promotion now, right? No. What would happen is, one of two things. One, suddenly this, these teams nobody wanted. Everybody wanted. Now, now these are good teams, so now everybody wants a team, right? My whole team, myself included, now, you know, would want to, they would want to move me, have me report to some other person. Or, it would be that the, the company just didn't want me to move. And no one would say, you can't move. No one would say, we don't want you to go anywhere. They would say things like, um, you know, you just, you just need to do a little more. So I do a little more. Then they would say, you're doing the most right now. We're going to need you to scale back. We've got to focus. Operate. They would say, we're going we're gonna to have you report to this person because, you know, they've got an advanced degree, you don't have an advanced degree. Cool, I'm going to go out, I'll get my master's. Then it was, 
you know, maybe you could do this, but right now you're gonna stay there until you get, you know, a different kind of experience. This person has had experience at these much bigger companies. That's where we're headed. That's why we're gonna go in this direction. No problem. I'm gonna go do that. I will go, I'll diversify my background, I get it, right? After a while, it started to dawn on me that it, it kind of didn't matter what I would do, right? It meant that I had to learn how to now advocate for myself. The same way I had to fight for these folks on my teams to help them be brought in, to help them be treated equitably, I had to do for myself. And sometimes that would manifest itself in me leaving the job. Sometimes it would, it would manifest itself in me getting the promotion right, that I, I believe I earned, or the raise that I believe I earned. But the turning point for me was one time at a job where it was the same pattern, you know, I did the thing, fixed the team, everybody's happy, um, I was ready to move forward, and one person in particular really went out of their way to stand in my way. And it felt a lot like, almost like a final exam of just all this experience that I had, everything that I had experienced, this one person was doing all of it, all of it keeping me out of meetings, taking my ideas, talking about me behind my back, really trying to mess with my reputation. Anything they could do to keep me right where I was. And the interesting part that time was that for the first time, I didn't internalize it. I saw what was happening. I saw, I saw for what it was. And it hurt, it sucked. I'm not even gonna pretend that was fun to go through but I knew what was happening. And in that moment, I understood fully that I was all done letting other people decide my work and how far I would go. And that's what STEM Energy was born out of. So when I launched the program, it wasn't just about, I know from firsthand experience the value of diversity in tech. It wasn't just about that. I saw it, I knew it, but I also knew there was another layer that had to be considered, that had to be thought of. And so we developed it to be both. We teach the skill, the hard skill, the coding, the project management, the UI, UX, we teach all of that. But we also make sure that the women who come through this program understand what it is to be very underrepresented in a space that you love, that you are so passionate about, and that you really want to keep going in. And how do you navigate that? How do you keep yourself moving forward without losing your sense of self? And be okay, right? So we are three years old now. We've had three cohorts, and each and every time, I'm reminded of why I'm doing what I'm doing. I want to replicate the work I had been doing, but have a bigger effect, you know? Get, get more people doing that same thing, having that same mindset, you know, stuff like that. The space is a safe space. We come in, we hang out, we intentionally, intentionally make it you know, arts, we, we play music, the women pick the songs. If they don't pick a song, I get to pick Beyonce. That's how the rules go. It's a good time. But one thing that always stands out is here's a space where they can bump their heads safely. Here's a space where they can learn and fall down and not have to worry about how they're being perceived or being the last one picked to be in the, in the project group or something like that. And the confidence that comes out of that experience and the things that they do when they leave is everything. It's everything. And, and that's the message I, I'll leave with you all today, too, is that there is space for women, women with accent, women who are 65. <laughs> There's space for all of us. And we all have the ability to come into these spaces and not just you know, try it out a little. We, we can come into these spaces, we can put down our roots and thrive here. Um, 
it can happen. And sometimes it can feel a little isolating if you're, you know, someone like me who spent all those years as the only one in the room who looked like me. But when you find that community, you find that village, you can do, you can do anything. She nodded. <laughs> year after year, just continuing to learn um, from all the panels like you. Um, for the next about half an hour, we're going to open it up to questions for the students to ask any of the panelists, um, and then maybe some faculty and staff. Yes? Um, what was all y'all's favorite classes in, in college? I want to know. When you guys are getting your degrees. <laughs> Did you ever have a favorite class? I think it's cool. Favorite class was art. Art? So, drawing, watercolor. That was my favorite class. Not physics, or art science. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. That's crazy. I was like, was anything? Like some dance classes? <laughs> this is the stuff that was really. It, although there was a, um, a speech class that I really enjoyed too, actually. That I liked a lot. Okay, well, growing up, I loved art. So I took a lot of art classes in high school. But I took everything else too, physics, and chemistry, all that. But when I went to college, believe it or not, there was a class that I absolutely loved. I failed it. But I loved it. It was material science. It was so interesting. It just, you know, I, I would sit there, I was fascinated with the, the lectures and, you know, I'd have the hourlies and exams, I'd get two problems right, two problems wrong, so I failed the class. So. But it was, I, I still, but you know, the thing is, though, it, it was it's information that I still think about, believe it or not. Told you I'm a nerd. <laughs> nerd for the world. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my favorite class was physics. And chemistry. I like the lab work. I like the science, you know, behind. Uh, I loved it. I didn't like calculus, right? We already know that. But I love physics. Uh, I did. I was passionate about physics and chemistry. I was in the marching band, so um, I actually loved that because we got to travel a lot. And again, it's a fundamental thing where, at the time, shy little Danielle still took two decades to get past that shy little Danielle, which is still very much there, but that was my favorite. Second up was um, mm -hmm. creative writing in college, and I hated it. So, yeah, organic chemistry being in my system. I actually wanted to add, when I said art, that was in school. But in college, um, it was electronic. Yeah. And the microprocessors part, uh, where you had to do assembly language and all those, that was very interesting. Uh, so those, that was at college level. Okay, uh, additional questions. Um, uh, so my question was, uh, it's just a bit general. Um, what kind of differences would you say in, in treatment experience, what have you, um, uh, would any of you have uh, comparing uh, private sector jobs to government jobs or um, subcontracting, uh, that kind of thing? We can go down the line. I have a feeling this one's going to be flexible. <laughs> <laughs> so private, typically. I didn't really uh, work in a school except when I started teaching. I'm uh, doing a thing. There we go. Um, <laughs> So I actually forgot to mention, and I was only reminded after like the fourth person with all these amazing things that we talked about. Um, I founded uh, our Women in Leadership group at Rapid um, and was actually kept out of that same group when I worked for other companies because I did not have direct reports because as Shauna said, there's different patterns that emerged and mine was you can't lead because you've never led before. So um, that's something that I established. So I tend to also be the only one who looks at like me 
um, which is really sad if you think about it, because you know my above the iceberg qualities is that I'm female, right? I've got so below the iceberg. I have ADHD, late diagnosed in life, um, and it explains so much about me. But yeah, lots of uh, challenges. But I expect they're pretty similar in not in academia, but because you have both. Yeah, I got both, right? So uh, my main job, I work a uh, BA system. I'm a principal process engineer. If you're not familiar with BA system, we do defense work. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not allowed to say much about what kind of defense work. All I can tell, uh, I build part of military airplanes, firefighters, right? I love what I'm doing. I'm passionate about my work. Uh, and I do technical support, process engineering. So what exactly I do, I go on the floor, I, I'm responsible for, you know, uh, maybe technical support can be 40 people, 50 people, depends on the shift, and they build my product I'm responsible for, and if they have any issues to build stuff or uh, something is not right, uh, I gotta be there to figure out a problem solving and make sure that they build my product uh, co correctly. So. I work for defense company, uh, military standards, strict rules, and I love it. I love it. Uh, I did commercial before, and I work now you know, for Middlesex for the last 15 years, too. So I can see a change and a good change on both. Uh, I can see now in my full-time job as an engineer, uh, we are very much on women in technology. And, you know, equity and diversity, and I, I love diversity and stuff. And Middlesex, I know uh, we are very good about that too. So I can see a difference, and especially in the last few years, when I used to work in Lowell, it was different 17 years ago, 16 years ago, but these days it's amazing how much, you know, things changing. and. Coming in, I do military now for a BA for nine years, and before I used to work for Raytheon, another defense company. So I love that discipline, mindset, and you know, uh, strict. And I always say to my students, introduction to engineering: you want to be a good engineer, follow the print, follow the rules. We gotta stay, you know, uh, to uh, we have so much. But yeah, it's a. Uh, it's a good thing since happening, right? For the last few years, and okay, on both the middle sex and my full-time job, and I, I really am pleased with the results. Um, I've only been in the uh, private sector, but I'm trying to understand, so you want to know the difference between working in a government-led um, organization versus private? Yeah. Um, so, obviously, I can't answer that question, but, um, um, I can say though that over the years I've seen, you know, there's, I started in the industry in the, in the late 70s. Okay, um, the things that people would say to you, you would not say to somebody now. Okay, so I, I've seen it. But I've also seen, um, there's a thing called, I guess, kind of implied bias, you know, yep. where it's not politically correct. To express your opinions or your, you know, your bias towards somebody, but it's still there. It's still it's a, a level, de you know, deeper, right? So you, s I've seen that still. Um, I have to say though that the company I'm at now, um, I've never seen such a diverse culture within this company. is just amazing. Our teams are, you know, my my boss is from Mexico. My call, one of my coworkers originally grew up in Iran. Um, another coworker grew up in India. You know, our, our teams meetings are global. We have people from just about every every um, country now. It, it's it's amazing. So I think I would suggest as you look for companies throughout your career, look for companies who are very globally organized because that's where you're going to see a more um, I guess blended blended environment versus you know companies I've worked for in the past were all American companies. So that's that's where I, I see the big difference because we're a Japanese company with company you know with you know business units all over the world. So th there's a there's still I mean like I said there's still that implied bias. Um, you, you know people are still evolving. It's never going to go away until you know we completely evolve right to a certain point. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, 
I've worked in the private sector, um, startups, and then also some established companies. And um, now with this organization I founded, working with you know um, organizations that are more social impact, nonprofit, um, and I haven't worked in government, though I have had exposure to government agencies and other other types of organizations, healthcare, you know, things like that. Um, and so what I've noticed um, is that ultimately across the board, the potential is there for um, you know uh, any particular group to, to feel marginalized or to be treated in a marginalized <coughs> way particularly if it's traditionally um, a, 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 an industry that's dominated by one, one group, right? So you have some spaces where, in general, you know, it's, it's, it's fine, it's generally diverse, it's, it's cool, um, but I have another uh, colleague who works in aviation for the government, which is usually more male-dominated, and she has taken to not even using her name, she uses her initials, but the, the treatment of her as a woman is so different that she has to approach things in the most neutral possible way so that she can, you know, try to skip over that and get to the equity, right? Um, the other thing that I've noticed is there is a difference in the burden of proving your competency depending on where you are and who you're working with. Um, I have had like completely different experiences depending on the group of people I'm working with. Um, in versus in the private sector, working in tech, working in software development, versus working for myself, um, where I have more choice of who I'm choosing to partner with, choosing to work with, and so therefore I can come into these these kinds of discussions and. Um, negotiations with people who already assume a certain level of competency simply because I'm, I've started this and I've done this for a little bit versus being in a, in a job where you've been there and you've done the work and everything but still feels like daily you're proving that you still have to you know, do that work. So I really, I'm not sure that it, it matters if it's government or nonprofit or private where people are treated differently I think that you made a really great point about if you're looking for a place that's gonna be good and safe and um, really allow you to just be yourself and thrive, look at the company itself. Look at who's there, especially in top leadership on the board. That really says a lot. There could be a ton of diversity at entry level, but it stops. If, if it gets higher, that's a red flag, right? Um, you know, look for the culture, like the actual, the way people are engaging with each other, how they're treating each other, stuff like that. Um, and it becomes kind of a, it, it, you just take it at one by one, one by one. And, you know, no particular field is gonna necessarily be better or not, especially if it's something you really wanna do. But I wouldn't let it stop you. But just use those things to, to guide you. It's a difficult question for me to answer because my entire career has been teaching and research. So I have taught in private colleges and uh, universities versus the government, which is MCC is a government college. So I can uh, very well tell you that private colleges have different set of rules, which uh, they uh, will, which you may not understand the rules. But in a government college, there are certain set of rules, and they're answerable. They they fit the scheme and you know what is happening. So even if the pay is lesser in a government college versus a private college, but you know that you are, you are safer here. You're, um, you're protected by union, you're protected by rules because they're answerable. Uh, somewhere higher up in the government, somebody's watching them. But in private colleges, they will just chuck you out without uh, telling you why and you are not supposed to ask too many questions too. So um, this is just for the teaching career, if you are thinking about teaching careers. Private colleges pay you very well, uh, but um, I'm happy here.
which one of you said earlier, um, what got you into the, your interest of going into outer space and becoming like an astronaut in that type of field? I didn't get your question. Earlier you said that one of you wanted to become an astronaut and go into that type of field. What got you into it? How to get into it? What, what, what got you into it? What got me into it? Uh, thinking about going to, okay, um, I guess um, back in there, there was this TV show coming uh, from, from uh, on our channel. We just used to have one channel then. Okay, there wouldn't be a plethora of channels there. So it, every Sunday there would be a program coming, Carl Sagan's show. And I used to watch that a lot growing up in my early school years. So that's from where I developed this passion of uh, following pursuing astronomy and all. So I hope I answered your question. Was that the question? Um, yeah. What uh, non-classified uh, projects are you guys most proud of, and what impact do you think it had? Non-classified? Yeah. So it's not classified, yeah. Project is something you found. Yeah, so I, um, when I was in India as a postdoc, I was working on gamma ray astronomy. So um, that's a very important uh, subject because it, tell, it helped us find the beginnings of the universe. So that project I had to um, work on for a long time. And we, uh, we found out that there's cosmic background radiation because of that. Uh, uh, we could find out some results that would support the theory of uh, when, when the beginning of the time was. So that was one of the projects that I was working. Um, then I was working at Boston College in a uh, wide area augmentation services and GPS and space weather connected. So how an event in the space um, could triple the GPS global positioning system. So I was working with that. Uh, but these are all research areas, so it's not like it was a job or something. I was a researcher. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so during my career of manufacturing engineer, uh, my favorite job was working for School for the Blind in a water town, Perkins uh, water town. I was a manufacturing engineer for two years, building trailers. That was the most, uh, uh, I think I'm gonna remember all my life. I worked with kids, blind kids, and uh, you know, uh, I developed a new program, a new, together with another team, we developed uh, an electronic brailler, so we took a mechanical brailler, convert to an electronic brailler, and uh, was very rewarded. I get to work with I get to work with students, blind students. They taught me braille. They taught me to listen to the machine. They taught me how to, you know, the carriage was traveling. I learned so much for those kids and people with, you know, no vision. And uh, when I left that company, I was heartbroken because the reason why I left my dream job was to get into Raytheon. I wanted to do military, right? So. I became U.S. citizen, and when I left uh, Watertown and School for the Blind uh, was t two years later, I still continued to go there to work part-time to build those brailers because I was so attached to the people. I was attached to the type of work I was doing. Going to Raytheon and the type of work I was for Raytheon, I was building missiles. I wasn't too happy about it. This was part of my job, so going to Watertown and build railers kind of clean my soul, right? So kind of make peace with myself. I said, okay, this is a military, I signed for it. I, I have to protect my country and I have to do whatever I have to do. But building railers and the type of product I built, it kind of let me sleep in the night. And I was very happy about it. And fair enough, a couple months later, I quit rate. I said, no more, I'm done. I'm, I'm done my dream job. I don't want that job anymore, right? And I move on dif different defense company, but I build other stuff with people. The stuff I build right now uh, save people's lives. 
So this is the way I see it. I still do defense work, I still do military, but save people's lives, right? So, and I can't sleep in the night. I don't know how I follow Iron Man over here, but um, <laughs> mine is a recently released product. So again, I'm a product manager, and I was kind of tossed in as my first project to a software program, and again, my background's biology. I know software, but not well. Um, but it was to basically support, you know, every drug product that you take, your loved ones take, um, that cures, you know, their illness or is something that they're on, or I did IVF to get my children, and so part of that process is injecting yourselves with needles, and you really want those needles to not have bacteria. Um, so mold alarm, I don't know if you, it, it's the software that I launched in November, we can differentiate on those plates. So no longer, you know, even though we're giving them a count, a lot of places after the New England compounding pharmacy incident that happened about a decade ago now, um, some people died from meningitis because of mold. So this basically allows us so our algorithm can say there's mold on that plate or there's not. So you can have a few bacteria because they're everywhere, right? In certain environments, it's okay if they exist, but a mold is no go because of the implications. And so I'm very proud of that, both from, I think, the impact and then also from how much I got to learn. Um, you know, it's just really rewarding and got to interact with a lot of different people with, you know, different perspectives, which again is coming back, I think it's a thread here. Diversity is good, not just because it's something that's important that we should do, it's because literally, if you take everyone and their different thoughts and like look at a problem, you're gonna get all the answers, right? And then you can choose which one makes the most sense. But if you have everyone who has the same viewpoint, it, you just all have the same answer, it's very boring, so. You should, you should shout the microphone. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, good. <laughs> I have a question about how you, do you have any, do you have any advice to teach for a woman? Uh, to balance like work and life because like let's say you have a family and you have kids. So this is uh, kind of frustrating how you can keep up working, um, studying and having a family. Maybe you can give up any, any advice. Can that. I say something quickly? Mm. Um, there is no such thing as work life now. I was about to say that. So <laughs> you have to get that out of your head yeah. and just do your best and you know, Get, get help where you can, um, and, and don't beat yourself up if you're not super well. Yeah. You do your best, and you, know, you just just move on. And work-life balance is a myth. And I, I, I think would, we've yeah, all yeah, probably yeah, found yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, I can tell we're all just like ready to, yeah. <laughs> to answer this one. Yeah, this definitely, I think one of the, the misconceptions too is that you have to do it all. You do not. You don't. You don't have to do all the stuff. You do the things that move you, you do the things that mean things to you, and it will all work itself out. As long as you're prioritizing your well-being, your sense of self, that's really it. Because nothing else will get the goodness if you're not okay, right? You can't, you can't, what, is, what does that say? You can't drink from an empty cup. So if you're always giving, you're serving from your cup, to everybody around you, you're taking care of the job and your kids and the house and, and that spot on the, on the table, but you're empty, that it's not going to help you at all. So, yeah, no, no balance thingies, <laughs> no, none of that, just focus on you. So it's okay to take a break, and even I took a four-year gap when my son was little, and it's full of challenges. Like, uh, if uh, you have to come to work and your, your child is suddenly sick, what do you do? So many times I've taken my son to my uh, to UMass level and put him in a couch outside the class, tell him to sit there, he, he would have fever or something. So I've done that too. But uh, we, uh, between me and my husband, we prioritize whose work is important. So I laid low for some years until my child was uh, growing up. Now he's in college, I'm man free. So, <laughs> but uh, there, there's always, you have to look at your family dynamics first, what is more important, and uh, can I take a break? Uh, then take a break if it's needed. 
I, I did take four year, four year break and I don't um, regret it because if I had not taken that break, I would not have cherished the time that I spent with my son and I bonded so well with him. If I was crazy busy, I would have missed those beautiful moments. So don't, don't regret that, okay? I got no kids, so. <laughs> <laughs> I balance well. I got no kids. There's no such thing as balance, but I, I similarly, right, so I made different choices. I did not take time off, and trust me, there was a struggle there, right? It was, am I spending enough time? I mean, mom guilt is a whole separate thing that we don't have time to go into, um, but, you know, I think the ladies down here summed it up best, right? There's no such thing, and you have to prioritize what gives you spirit and hope, and for me, I have two little boys. I always thought I'd have girls, that didn't work out. It's fine. But I want to model for them what their mom does, right? Because growing up, my mom worked in the workforce and I still didn't picture myself in any of the roles I've ever had. And I love that nowadays, if they do ask a kindergartner to draw a picture of a scientist, there's like a 50-50 split of they draw women now, which is huge, right? So for me, it was important to cherish the time, you know, there's days where I shut the laptop and we are done, right? Because there's always more to give, but I know I can't give. So it's really, yeah, you said it best. Know yourself, when you're empty, you stop. And, and forgive yourself for it, because that is hard the first time, or 50 times. Yeah. Yeah. And you gotta learn to say no, too. So, you know, <laughs> at my full-time job, people come to me saying, can you help me, can you help me? And at the beginning, say, yes, 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 I will do it. And I overwhelm myself because I don't like to say no. And this has happened to all of us, right? You want to help, you want to be there, you want to be a team player, you want it, you know? And in the end, everybody's going home and you end up doing their work. I'm like, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> well, the, uh, she told me I have a soccer, you know, whatever, play. So I said, oh, you go home because your kids are, you are busy with the kids and I have to do your work because I don't have kids. Happened to me a couple times, right? So. Okay, you gotta prioritize, you gotta learn to say no in a nice way. Say, hey, listen, I, I'm overwhelmed, I have so many projects, because if you take too much, you're gonna get sick, and it happened to me so many times. You get sick, you get mental, you know, you're not gonna be able to sleep in the night because you wanted to finish all. You're not gonna finish all. You're gonna fail in some of them, and it, it, the, you know, it, it's not okay. So learn to say no, you know, look on your, prioritize your you know, actions, whatever you have to do, and don't say, I'll help you, don't jump, because they're gonna take advantage. They're all gonna take advantage of you. My name is Tyler. Um, I guess I have a quick question. Is I know that you grew up in Romania, and you grew up in India, so receiving an education as a woman, was it any different or tougher um, there compared to here? For women in general, would you, would you say so? Do you want, do you want to say <laughs> So, uh, fortunately, uh, it's not difficult in India because it's expected that you have to study, especially from the community I belong to, literacy is 99%. So, and they so, um, our parents, um, especially for our community. Uh, education is very important. So our community is more literate, the site and uh, professors, managers, and like that, so never do the business jobs. So I have no idea uh, about finance or anything. I'm very bad at that. Because I didn't grew up seeing all those uh, things in my, in my family. Um, so it was not difficult to get education there. But I know there are places in India where girls do not receive the same amount of education. They are treated differently. Um, but I, I guess I skipped that part. I, I was not in that. Yeah. Oh, I think I can talk loud enough. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> I went to a polytechnic institute, right? Six girls, 150 guys. Strict rules, right? Strict rules. They expect a lot from us. I got full scholarship. I knew if I don't maintain a certain GPA, they are going to kick me out. They are not gonna, you know, I have to pay. No, they're gonna kick me out and someone else is gonna take my spot. 
So it was a very strict competition between all of us, right? We got to maintain the GPA. I needed to work to make extra money. So it was very strict, and we didn't have that technology. I finished my college 28 years ago. We didn't have internet back then, right? It was hard. Books was black and white. So it was hard, and I learned to design by hand, right? AutoCAD students, right? You guys, you have software these days. I didn't have that, right? Everything was done by hand, right? So it was more strict, I think, and coming to United States and kind of, I think some of the course, college courses I've you know, um, been teaching here and I hear my students, when I looked it up to my background from where I'm coming from, I said, oh my gosh, I took this class in my sixth grade, right? So it's a little bit different, right? Or math, you know, calculus three, I took it in high school and you know what I mean? So they have a little bit different way they teach stuff over there. Now maybe they changed because they're trying to line up with the other countries. But back then, I learned, you know, course material for college level and all those stuff. And moving here, I realized, we, you know, it's a little bit different. But again, math is math everywhere. Physics is physics everywhere. Chemistry is chemistry. You know what I mean? I was lucky that my diploma, my Polytechnic Institute, when I moved to United States, they accepted, right? They accepted, I sent it for evaluation here to United States, and they accept all my credits because I finished engineering. If I were finished high school, law school, or economics, you might not be accepted, right? This is when you gotta go to do extra classes. But for engineering, I, they accept all my credits. So they give me the title, they give me, they recognize all my degrees. So I was lucky. Right, so uh, it, it's good and bad. I love the education in the United States because it's more, and I know now to college, the way we teach is more flexible. We are more interactive with our students. I went to school when it was black and white. It's like my teacher was yelling at me. I was like, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. I couldn't say a word. I didn't like that, right? That strictness. Now, here in community college, we, we and you know, you know me, guys. I, I can be strict, I can be, but friendly, and we talk to each other, and I listen to you, and you know, we communicate it, and I like to listen to my students, and they put me on the side, say, can I talk to you for one second, and they share with me the promise, like, you know what, it's okay, I can give you a little extension, one more week, just get it done, right? I, when I grew up, when I went to school, you miss a deadline, you are out. You are gonna, you are gonna be on the waiting list to be kicked out. And, and this was very strict, and I didn't like it. But I needed to follow, if not, I was, losing my scholarship. So you guys, you are lucky, right? You're lucky you don't have that, you know, strictness. Okay, I think we have time for one more It's really just kind of like playing along. And I used to think that I just had no real personality of my own, that I would enter a situation and just kind of like go with it. I've always been able to get along with people, generally speaking, regardless of where they are in their belief systems. And I thought that was just me flexing into that. Um, so it's kind of a gift, but also, you know, every performance review my entire career, and this was shattering for me, said, Danielle's so great at doing everything but Right, and, and to Shauna's point, there's patterns, right? If I'm given the hard assignment and I do the thing that no one else wanted to do, is I don't get promoted for that. I don't get a raise, I get, good job, do the next thing. Or mm -hmm. that, was, that was acceptable for your level, right? So 
it's hard. I don't know. What I do know is medication helps me not lash out later on. So I take it during the week. I'm very, it helps me focus because one of the other superpowers of ADHD is hyper focus. So if you like really into a topic and my gut, good God, you can't select it. Like it just kind of comes to you and then you're down a rabbit hole and you spend three hours researching something you have no idea why you got there, but you did and it's cool. Um, but I can aim that a little bit better. Um, anxiety, yeah, I'm, I'm a hot mess, um, but it's okay. <laughs> right, I, I, again, that's both familial trait as well as ADHD. So it's just, it is a lot, I think, there's a lot of education with TikTok um, and other platforms now where it's like, oh, wow, it's not just me. And that takes the self-shame and negative self-talk out. And when you stop talking so crappily to yourself, some of that anxiety goes away. Not completely. You know, I see a psych, I see a therapist, um, and try to develop healthy habits. And yeah, so it, it's a combo, but it is an interesting thing. I just. I think it would have made me le feel less bad about myself, which then would have caused less anxiety. Because the amount of times where my boss could literally just want to ask me to lunch, and I sent myself into a nice old spiral because I got a text that said, hey, are you in office today? And I thought I was getting fired. Why, why do normal people, like neurotypicals, think that? Because I do. Like a simple <coughs> message is do. So yeah, it's, it's just really fascinating. Um, and you know, there's obviously other forms of neurodivergencies as well, right? Some people don't read as fast, there's dyslexia, there's autism, there, you know, there's plenty of things that none of us can see. And so another thing that's helped me is just giving the grace not only to myself, but to others. If someone's struggling in a moment, it doesn't mean they're not smart. It doesn't mean they're not capable. They might just need a hot second to read the material and digest it, right? So it's really, it, Becoming a mother as well as getting that diagnosis helped me learn patience with others because I, I really do want to digest information as quick as possible. Again, it's part of the thing, right? So um, I would get impatient with people and that wasn't fair to them. So hopefully that answered that. I, it was everywhere, but oh, you can have my card later. <laughs> okay, well, thank you everyone for the great questions. Thank you to the panelists for coming. Um, if you have additional questions that you want to ask the panelists to specifically, um, they'll be around for a short while, so feel free to come up. Um, the panelists, we also have a small gift for them um, to take home, and then we'll also do a picture as well. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you.